Greater Abuja Water Supply Project in focus as Minister of the FCT Defense 2023 Appropriation. House of Representatives begins investigation into incessant national grid collapse in Nigeria. And House comments use of geospatial intelligence in tackling insecurity. The House of Representatives has begun scrutinizing the 2023 appropriation of ministries, departments and agencies of government, with the Federal Capital Territory Administration taking the lead. Hello and welcome to you and your reps on the NTA. I'm Victor Azo. Thank you for joining us. The Federal Capital Territory Administration is to enhance supply of portable water in the Capital Territory through the implementation of the Greater Abuja Water Supply Project in 2023. The Minister, Mohamed Bello, appeared before the National Assembly Joint Committee on the Federal Capital Territory to defend the administration's 2023 budget, as Ignatius Nkwa tells us. 13.4 billion naira is the national priority budget for the Federal Capital Territory in 2023. Four billion of this will be spent on the Greater Abuja Water Supply Project conceptualized five years ago. The project, a bilateral initiative, is expected to improve water supply in 26 districts in Phase 2 and 3, which include Guarimpa 1 and 2, Utako, Dutse and Lokogoma. Some of the projects that are going to be implemented, uh, that has to do with the Mpape Shere Galui Road, as well as a number of other interventions under our Satellite Towns Development Authority, as well as the Greater Abuja Water Supply Project, which is a bilateral initiative uh, with the government of China to enhance water supply in the FCT. When states around FCT like Kogi, Benue are experiencing flood, we have not recorded a single flooding in Abuja. It's worth commending. The committee made submissions on how to improve on the various sectors of the FCT economy. You can set up agro-allied industries at the rural areas, in particular the areas like uh, uh, rice milling plants, cashew processing plants. One great favor you can do for Nigeria is to ensure the commencement of property tax, which was already in the, in the law that we have passed and are sent to by the Mr. President. Let us start property tax as on January. Construction of solid waste transfer stations in the FCT and the completion of six area council stadium facilities are to cost one billion naira each. Investments in the power sector infrastructure and deep-rooted collaboration among operators are the solutions preferred to address the incessant national grid collapse in Nigeria by principal actors. Now, this was at the investigative hearing on national grid collapse conducted by the House of Representatives. Between January and July this year, Nigeria has witnessed different national grid collapses. This, the transmission company of Nigeria, estimated to be six. This one we have had this year, we've had four of them, but they have not been collapsed, is disruption. And disruptions have been as a result of, there could be human factors, there could be uh, implement, equipment factors, there could be um, political factors, there could be other factors. This is what the House, by her motion, mandated its committee on power to address. If the transmission has real capacity to manage the transmission line, I don't think there is any need for Shiroro to cause any system collapse. There is no day when generation company will say we have generated so much megawatts and TCN is unable uh, to evacuate it. How do we get out of this problem? Once and for all, the blame game is enough. What are the solutions? For the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, the trajectory of the incidences of the national grid disruption demands more investments. I not deny the fact that today TCN has infrastructural issues. I mean, to say it's world class is just deceiving ourselves. So, solution number one is investment. Other stakeholders expressed hope that this legislative intervention will address all the issues.
Elsewhere, the use of geospatial intelligence was the game changer in tackling insecurity in Nigeria as it enabled identification and neutralizing of targets with precision. Now, this was the view of the House of Representatives Committee on Defense while oversighting some military agencies in Abuja. We also need to prioritize and make sure that in the forthcoming budget that only things that are priority that will help curb insurgency are what will put on the front burner. The others will look at uh, taming. You understand? So whatever would help fight this insurgency to its logical constitution, I think that will prioritize. And we've all agree with them on that. It's a visit to meet heads of military formations under the purview of the committee, which affords opportunity to assess financial performance vis-a-vis -vis service delivery in line with constitutional mandates, while as the Defense Space Administration, the military agency in charge of security in cyberspace and satellite, the committee was updated on newly acquired facilities, among them the Ground Satellite Recovery Station, the first of its kind in Africa. It's not just for military. It's going to serve border for border patrol. It's going to serve for pollution, uh, population control. Demography is going to help in, you know, knowing the uh, desertification, how pipeline monitoring, monitoring the trunk A roads in the country, and then a whole lot of socioeconomic NEMA will play into it fire service, um, immigration, customs, and many other agencies will key into it. The lawmakers were also at the National Defense College. Nigeria's foremost military training center, which has over the years updated officers in terms of tactics and strategy. We have international participants uh, in our accommodation and the syndicate rooms. At the permanent site, we have so many projects, prominent of which is the academic block. And that project, you know, has been there since uh, 2016, there about. Uh, money has been released, but the money being released over time has been uh, in such a piecemeal arrangement uh, that do not uh, permit the completion of the projects. The entourage while engaging heads at the Defense Research and Development Bureau was informed on collaborations by the agency to implement Executive Order 5. We are dealing with the Defense Research and Development Organization India where we are jointly trying to develop and improvise explosive device, uh, detecting uh, device in collaboration with Center for Energy Research at uh, Amadi Bello University. All three agencies sought increased funding for improved services to further secure the country's land and uh, maritime space. What does the phrase suspension of the rules imply? What rules are suspended by the way and in what circumstances does the rule apply? We put these questions to Chair of the House Committee on Rules and Business. For example, uh, one, uh, rules that, one rule that is, is mostly suspended is Order 8, Rule 4. Order 8 provides for matters of urgent national importance. The rule provides that uh, Whenever uh, there is an issue which threatens lives and property of Nigerians, House attends to it immediately. So, whenever an emergency arises, a member wishing to table a motion will now request Mr. Speaker to the attention of Mr. Speaker through. Uh, that uh, citing that order, Order 8, Rule 4, that he wants to move a motion under that because the matter is urgent. The Speaker will now request that House accepts. Now, even when a, the, the, the House considers that, yes, a matter is urgent, by urgency it means the House will now accept to take that matter immediately but we we'll suspend deliberation till the next day. But now, members want the matter to be taken immediately, not, not delayed to, to, to the next day. They'll move that, okay, 
the relevant section be suspended entirely to enable the matter to, to be taken immediately. And once it is done, then uh, when the, that, that one, uh, uh, section of the, of the rule is suspended, the matter is taken, then the member is allowed to move that motion and the House will decide immediately on that uh, uh, motion. The member representing the Biriniwa Guri Kirikasama Federal Constituency of Jigawa State and Chairman of the House Committee on Rules and Business, Hassan Fulata, has been speaking on the Pension Reform Act Amendment Bill 2022, which seeks to accommodate the FCT in the contributory pension scheme. Let's hear him. FCT, uh, it wears two caps. It is both a ministry at the federal level and also it is also regarded as a state government without a governor so without a governor or without a legislature so the fct or the national assembly now legislates for the federal capital territory the minister of FCT is both a minister and also a quasi, a governor. The National Assembly is also acting as the state assembly for, for, for the FCT. So the FCT minister doesn't, if you look at the budget, he brings his budget directly to the National Assembly. His budget is not contained in, in, the, in the executive budget. He brings his budget directly to the National Assembly. Whenever he wants anything, he brings his, the issues to the National Assembly. So the same thing goes for the pension. We have the National Pension Act, which applies to federal government employees. Yes. Now, the various state governments also have enacted their own pension uh, acts. Okay. So the, the pension you acted, you, uh, this in, you had me reading out, introducing, applies to... Uh, uh, FCT workers to benefit also the contributory pension uh, uh, arrangement where every month deductions are effected from, from, uh, from worker salary and then the, 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 the government, the FCT administration now also brings its own share to complement the, what was deducted from, 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 uh, uh, from, from, from the workers and then it is saved for the rainy day on retirement you, you are given a lump sum which is akin to uh, gratuity. And then the rest is spread over a period of time. Monthly, you are given something that comes in every month into your account as pension. So, so what we did was just for the FCT. And ordinary Nigerians on the streets of Abuja continue to have their say on the 2023 budget proposal. What areas would they rather have prioritized? Our government should fight insecurities. They know how to finance the poor in order for them to go for in order for every other person to go back to their business places to do whatever they have been doing. There's much we have to do in agri, but Nigerians now have diverted to to oil and not focusing on agri. Infrastructure. Why do you say so? Uh, because it's causing a lot of accident on the road, bad road. Insecurity is there, infrastructure is there, education is there. Like, we are, we are all Nigerians. Our children are just going back to school after eight solid months. And uh, that has cost a lot, you know, to families, to individuals, even the students. Education, please. Because in any place, anywhere, wherever you are today, it's a teacher that taught you to be there.
This week on You and Your Refs, the committee segment takes a look at climate change and how the 2023 appropriation might take care of the issues. So we spoke with a sponsor of Nigeria's climate change bill, Now Act, Samuel Onibo, to get his views. The government is aware of the challenges, you know, that uh, we are facing as a nation, security, employment, agriculture, and all that. How do we tackle them since our resources are rapidly dwindling? So but to be able to do that, you have to look for uh, money here and there to execute your project. A budget and therefore they are doing all they can to tackle these challenges even if it means overstretching yourself a little bit in terms of some of the deficits that we are going to incur in trying to implement the budget for 2023 security is number one for me because unless the country is properly secured and you have no reason claiming you are in government. You have no reason asking somebody to pay taxes and be loyal to you. You don't want a situation where people are providing security for themselves, tying road by themselves, providing water for themselves. The next thing they'll ask you is, why exactly do you want me to pay taxes or why do you want me to be loyal? So security is key because it has also the potential to attract investors to know that, okay, their investment is not going to go up in flames if they bring it into the country. So security is key. So that we do not have problems coming from farmers and headers, you know, leading to loss of man hour, increased cost of production, loss of revenue, because people are not sure of what is going to happen the next moment. Security is key, because without security, you cannot really plan and invest. And the other one is, we have to invest put money for security, and then put money to provide employment for the youths. If you check the population, if you want to check INEC record as a guide, as a recent guide, you know, since we did our population census since 1996, just use the INEC guide. You discover that out of about 10 or so millions, if you checked the percentage of the people who registered, it's just between 35 down to 18 years. And most of these people are out of job. They're unemployed. You have a duty, like I said before, to tie your policies, its implementation, into the provisions of the Constitution in Section 14, provision of security and the welfare of the people. We have to find a way to create employment. You understand that if you are blowing all the grammar, you do not provide employment. It's difficult for you to hold the young people from straying away. So, if I were to implement, I will focus on security, I will focus on creating employment, then you tie into it other areas of production, agriculture, manufacturing, so that truly you have a productive nation and not a nation that is totally dependent on the trickles that come from the Federation Accounts Allocation Committee. I am not totally satisfied. First, I've been worried about the proper implementation of the National Council on Climate Change. But I'm pleased that Mr. President recently inaugurated this just about two weeks or so back. Uh, I'm also not pleased because if you check what is provided for like maybe a Department of Climate Change, the Ministry of uh, Environment and all that, you discover that perhaps we, are, we still have not left what we experienced. You know, in the early days when I chaired the House Committee on Climate Change, where there was always a swing on the budgetary provision for climate change. Uh, at some point, about 2016 or so, we had $3 billion. And in the subsequent year, when we worked very hard, we were able to raise it to about $8 billion, talking about provisions, budgetary provisions for different sectors, you know, in MDAs that are tasked with the responsibility of arresting the devastating effects of climate change. But to have such a swing is not healthy. Even right now, I don't even think they have done better. 
So for the president to have inaugurated the National Council on Climate Change, it's a plus. For him to have also appointed the DG, it's a plus. But in my letter, because I did letters both to the vice president, the minister of justice, and the SGF, where I raised concerns about non-implementation of the act nearly about eight months or so by the time I did that letter in July without inauguration, without setting up the group on carbon budget, which is some of the things we are supposed to talk about as we go for COP27. So I was concerned about these areas. But I do believe that, well, we have started, no matter how late, that we'll be able to do that. But let me use this opportunity to say that there's need for better and well-coordinated implementation of the National Council on Climate Change so that all the other MDAs, for instance, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Water Resources, Minister of Petroleum, Women Affairs, Transportation, that they are all carried along. Because any appearance that, OK, the National Council on Climate Change belongs to one ministry or the other has the potential to discourage the other ministries from bringing their best forward to achieve the lofty ideas, objectives that are contained in the National Council of, on Climate Change. So it's important that we look towards there and ensure it's very, very, very smooth and faithful implementation for the good of all. Today, we have seen the devastating effects of climate change all over the nation, all over the world. So it's a real threat that no one can afford to play with. In terms of implementing the uh, National Council on, I mean, uh, the uh, Climate Change Act 2021, all hands must be on deck. Like I said, I'm happy that all the presidential candidates have been asked these questions and they've been giving their responses. All hands must be on deck. And we have to work as a team. And if you remember, I had mentioned in the past that the reason why we raised the status of the National Council on Climate Change to the level of it being chaired by Mr. President is because we are aware the world is changing and it's changing rapidly with the effects of climate change. And that's why we said Mr. President has to chair the council and his absence the vice president so that you're able to bring all the other ministries, you know, on board along with their ministers. And then the Office of the National Security Advisor, bring him on board because there is also contained in the act. The central bank governor, he has to be on board because of the, you know, money that you are going to spend and the impact. And then you also bring the chairman of the governor's forum on board. He's also there in the act. In addition, the president of uh, National Association of uh, you know, Local Governments of uh, Nigeria all are on board with these ministers to take critical decisions. You can see where we are today. So I have some hope that since we've been able to inaugurate this act, and since the presidential candidates are already discussing this things, that we'll be able to do the right thing going forward. But let me also commend Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari GCFR, on how he's been very consistent in championing you know, uh, the fight against climate change, beginning from his inaugural address on the 29th of May, 2015, when he said, I will fight climate change. And he was there with us in Paris when the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was passed. He was also there with us in, uh, he was there with us in Marrakesh. He went on to sign the Paris Agreement on Climate Change at the UN, you know, on September 22nd, 2016. And I can tell you that he's been moving, attending critical meetings and making his contributions. And finally, he was able to break the jinx of signing the bill on climate change, which of course, you know, started in the sixth assembly, third in the sixth assembly, third in the second assembly, I mean seventh assembly, third in the eighth assembly, until it was signed 
into law in the Ninth Assembly under his leadership. So I think we have a direction where we are going now. There's need for all hands to be on, on deck. There's need for sensitization. There's need for awareness campaign for us to be able to fight this monster. Indeed, it's a monster that needs no introduction, given the ongoing impact of it. But that's where we leave it on you and your reps. We thank you for watching. I'm Victor, as we'll see you next time.